or speaking on the new vaccine introduction processes in India. So when we are looking at a country like India, it's, it's a very large uh, public health program where we are almost targeting 26 million new bought cohorts and almost 29 million pregnant mothers every year. And uh, at present, there are 12 vaccine preventable diseases which are being covered under the national immunization program of which 11 nationwide and one is subnational. More than 12 million sessions are being planned every year and almost 30,000 cold chain points are there where vaccines are stored across the country. When, when you're looking at the two achievements, one is polio free and second is neonatal tetanus elimination. So 2014 and 2016. If you really look at the roadmap of uh, the program, so 1978 was expanded program of immunization and 1985 was the universal immunization program. That's where the program scaled nationwide. And when we were looking at 1985, we had six vaccine preventable diseases. That's what was being covered uh, by the program. But when you look at 2021-22, we are covering almost 12 vaccine preventable diseases. And this is a roadmap of uh, uh, last five to six years, how the vaccines got introduced into the national immunization program. Whenever you're looking at the vaccine introductions, there are three basic things that one needs to look into. Whether we are introducing a new vaccine into the program, that's what happened in the Indian program. You had pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, you have rotavirus, you have IPV and pentavalent. You switch from the one vaccine product type to another vaccine product type, that's TOPV to BOPV as a part of the uh, polio eradication program. Then you had uh, switched from the DPT and hepatitis B into pentavalent, measles to measles rubella, TT to TD. Similarly, th the third component is that there is a change in the schedule. The vaccine is already in the program, but you change the schedules. And that happened when we were looking at the measles or JE, which was single dose to two dose. And when we are looking at the fractional dose IPV recently because of the guidelines. So we have introduced three dose of uh, fractional dose IPV into the national schedule. When we are looking at the processes of how does this decision takes place, it is basically the technical advisory group of uh, the uh, government of India, which advises, I mean, which was constituted in 200, uh, 2002 and was amended from time to time. And if you really look at the processes, it is basically an apex body makes the technical recommendations related to immunization, including introduction of new and underused vaccines. And it consists of the group of experts from the public health, pediatrics, epidemiology, infectious disease, clinicians, immunologists, uh, medical microbiologists, cold chain experts, logisticians, uh, statistic modelers, social scientists, drug regulators. It also includes uh, experts from the health economics, uh, nursing, pharmacy, immunization program managers, and then the health ministry is the ex officio member to this uh, group. And when you're looking at this particular committee, this committee not only looks at the various publications being published at the national level, but also at the international level and also looks at the recommendations made by the WHO, the SAGE recommendations, and, and, and looks into the different analysis. And it also looks into uh, the introduction of a new vaccine. The entity is supported by a subgroup. So basically, it is a subgroup which goes into the detailed deliberations and then makes it a recommendation to the technical subcommittee. And then the technical subcommittee uh, makes it to the recommendation to the ENTAGI and ENTAGI makes it recommendation to the ministry. So it is mandatory for all the members of this group to sign up declaring the conflict of interest so that whatever recommendation has been made is fair. When you're looking at the role of ENTAGI in the new vaccine introduction processes, so this is what we looked into is the technical subgroup looking into where they are supported by a domain expert looks into the new vaccine introduction. They make a recommendations to the ENTAGI. The ENTAGI would discuss uh, details uh, about its potential in inclusion and then it's followed by the decision of the health ministry and, and then it looks into the details of the work plan and its further introduction processes. So if I break down this into, into three groups, so ENTAGI is a technical process where, where the uh, different processes looks into a technical recommendation. Then there is an administrative processes within the health ministry and this administrative processes are basically to review the operational financing and, and, and uh, looking into the consideration cut whether this new vaccine could be introduced into the program. And, and, and there are two uh, committees within the administrative processes. And, and the second uh, committee would finally take a call of introducing it into the program. And then the third uh, group is the plan for introduction processes. Once 
the technical uh, uh, and the administrative process had been approved, then we, the other groups looks into how exactly the vaccine will be introduced. And, and for that introduction processes, they would look into the, the plan of introduction, whether uh, there, there is a detailed uh, technical specification of the vaccines is there. And, and then they would look at the implementation and, and phasing in processes. So these are the detailing processes that the process would look into. When I'm looking at the national technical body, this is a body which looks into the disease burden in terms of the incidence and prevalences, absolute number of morbidity, mortality, and epidemic and, and, and pandemic potentials. It would look into safety and efficacy of the vaccines under consideration and, and cost effectiveness of vaccine program and also at alternative then the vaccine introduction and, and vaccination schedules, its interchangeability, etc. This is what the technical body would be looking into. And, and the two administrative group, that is the EPC and the mission study group, uh, the, these are the administrative body would look into the availability and the uh, supply and productions of the vaccine and, and their product capacities, affordability and financial sustainability of the vaccination program, even if the initial introduction process is supported through an external funding agency. So that's where it would be looked into and program capacity to introduce a new antigen, including the cold chain capacities. So these are basically the administrative processes which are being looked into by the administrative group. So the approval processes when we are looking into, and, and if you are looking into the EPC, basically this is the inter-ministerial group where different ministries converge to make a decisions. And these are different ministries, which is listed at the bottom. So there, this committee would look into the detail and, and take a decision whether a new vaccine has to be introduced. And, and, and these proposals actually are made a detailed uh, proposal, which are being circulated to these various members. And this various member would look into that proposal. And then finally, this member would approve. So the other operational aspect that we're looking into and preparation of a technical specifications. And once the EPC and the MSG, that's the administrative process is completed, a technical committee is constituted to guide on the operational aspects such as phasing of the vaccines. If you want to introduce the vaccine in one single go or you want to introduce the vaccine in phases, then you need to look into the phasing of the vaccine where we introduce within the country, being a large country. We also need to look into the root, the dose of the vaccine, the delivery strategies and other state readiness. The program division also outlines the technical specification of the vaccine to initiate the procurement processes through the technical specification committee. And then the technical specification committee is established, formulate the technical specification, which is a constitute of a different, uh, uh, I would say, the administrative and the financial and administrative bodies in, into the key element part of it. And once the vaccine specification is finalized, then the procurement process will initiate because when we are looking at India, India also procures the vaccine on its own. So they need to make these specifications and, and introduce these vaccines. And the decision of new vaccine introduction is then communicated to the selected states where the phase introduction is happening. And, and there are operational guidelines, the IEC metrics are developed, the trainings are being planned, and the vaccines supply are ensured before the vaccine, the vaccine gets introduced into the program. When we are looking into uh, any new vaccine introduction, there are three ways of the new vaccine gets introduced. Either a vaccine gets introduced in a campaign mode. So you do a wide age group campaign followed by the vaccine getting introduced into the routine. And, and normally this uh, campaign, we would not be looking as a first choice because if you are doing a campaign, it requires a large quantum of vaccine and a large HR is required. And therefore this decision is only based on whether there is a technical or a public health reason. If there are public health exigencies like J Japanese encephalitis, there we have done a campaign. Or if it is an uh, technical reasons like measles rubella, where we call it a paradoxical shift of the uh, CRS, and that's where we start looking at the campaign. The second is routine introduction. Whenever you're talking about a routine introduction, and if it is to introduce in the first year of, of the age, you have to be careful that the vaccine, when you're introducing first year, you do not land up doing a campaign in the first year along with the newer cohort. So you, what you usually do it is tag it with existing vaccine, which is already in the program, so that whenever you're giving a first dose of that vaccine, your new vaccine gets introduced as a first dose along with that vaccine. And that's how the, the routine introduction is happening. And then the third way of introducing a new vaccine 
is you are replacing the existing vaccine with the new vaccine, which happened when we were switching from the trivalent OPV to bivalent OPV. And similarly, when we were switching from the measles to measles rubella and, and TT to TD vaccine. So that's where you, you have a very clear plan. And each of these, I'll have a detailed discussion. So uh, because of the time, I'm not getting into the details of how exactly we have switched from TOPV to VOPV or measles to measles rubella, etc. Let me, this is all, all, all the process of a new vaccine introduction. So let me uh, get into one of the vaccine, how we introduce it. And, and I'm getting into the rotavirus. In 2016, rotavirus, we planned for introduction. When we were trying to introduce rotavirus, there was three products in the market. The, if you really look at it, it was a pentavalent vaccine or a monovalent vaccine. One was three dose, one was two dose, three dose. The two were out of the cold chain. That means they were kept in two to eight degree. One was a frozen vaccine. So, so and, and then when you look at the dose schedule, so it was two ml, one ml, 0.5 ml. So this is all these vaccines. When you look at it, had, had different do dose schedules and different uh, schedules. So these were some of the issues that one has to think while you're trying to introduce a new vaccine. When we're looking at 2015, the country's burden of under five mortality, and if you really look at it, diarrhea constituted 24 percent, and 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 when we're looking at the number of deaths, it was 200,000 uh, deaths annually, which was happening under five mortality, which was 24 percent, and and when we further broken down the these deaths, we could see that almost 30 to 40 percent were because of rotavirus, and this was a study being conducted by ICMR, and 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 that is from where we could came to know the burden of this uh, rotavirus. The, the Antagi looked into these burdens and these data and finally made a recommendation for introduction of this rotavirus into the national immunization program. And these are exactly the wordings of the Antagi, which, which was being given at, as a part of the decision. And, and, the, and the bottom two squares are the technical subcommittee, which first deliberated on these databases and, and finally recommended for its introduction to the Antagi. But once the decision was made, there was a big challenge that we faced. In the BMJ, there was two articles. One article said, yes, the country should introduce rotavirus. And the second article said, no, the country should not introduce rotavirus because the data that was used, if you see the India's contribution to introduce a rotavirus vaccine in national childhood immunization program and, and supports the move. But the other group says the question on evidence used to support this vaccination is doubtful. And, and therefore, the vaccine should not be introduced. So these are the two published literatures, which I'm showing that these are the issues that we face when we were trying to introduce rotavirus vaccine into the national program. Then there were articles which was clearly saying that the risk of introduction after rotavirus is high and therefore it should not be introduced. We also had a court case where, where the petitioner said that the, the data that was used for introduction is incomplete and 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 uh, this data should be given to us we will look into this data and and uh, uh, and therefore they filed a court case saying that the the introduction should be stopped and the data should be given finally i would say the court case was disposed of and and we could finally move ahead and introduce this vaccine so these are the other things that we face when we try to introduce a new vaccine we developed the uh, technical guidelines uh, the operational guidelines, the frequently asked questions. So these were the detailed uh, deliberations being carried out and made these documentations. So these are various IEC materials that were there. While we introduce, we also need to think of that our immunization card also makes appropriate provision for recording these kinds of uh, new vaccine introduction. Also, the, the database where we are capturing these informations also should be updated so that at the end of the program, we should be able to not only give a, a immunization card where we are recorded a new vaccine, but also capturing the coverage data of, of these uh, places. So the if you really look at the roadmap of a rotavirus introduction from 2014, we had a, a vaccine which was totally frozen vaccine uh, and, and it was a five drop vaccine. By the time it was 2017, it was a liquid vaccine and, and this was a lyophilized uh, uh, vaccine which was to be reconstituted. And, and when we were introducing it, so we had clear two geographies where one area, it was only one type of vaccine which was being used and in the another area, another vaccine was used. One was the frozen vaccine and second was a lyophilized vaccine. 
and and therefore we were not even allowing the interchangeability so we went to the entagi again and said that can you look into it on the uh, question on interchangeability the entagi said that yes the vaccine can be interchanged and and that is where what we do did it is that we allowed the interchangeability specifically because it's a large country we see lots of people are moving from one state to the another so what we did we said that ki, the vaccine will remain the same type in one area and the another type in another area because one is a lyophilized vaccine where you have to reconstitute the second one is a frozen vaccine so handling was totally different so we allowed the interchangeability at the session site but we were ensuring the same vaccines to be supplied to the same area and and therefore the migrant children from other states were were allowed va- vaccination uh, and and not restarting the schedule and children coming from the private to uh, public sector etc we were allowed them for the vaccine interchangeability later on uh, the the lyophilized vaccine uh, product also came out with another product which was the liquid vaccine and and operationally it was almost similar to the other vaccine and therefore we also allowed this vaccine uh, change over into the session sites so if we do look at the at present the rotavirus vaccine that we are using it uh, is a five dose or two dose or a single dose the two dose was an earlier supply where it was a lyophilized vaccine and and which could which needed to be reconstituted but if you are looking at the first and the th- third this is a vaccine where we have allowed the interchangeability the recent change of uh, the the one of the product the rotavac has been that this was the open wild policy was not applicable now the open wild policy is applicable so again we find a disconnect between the rotacil which which there is no open wild policy versus which are with the rotavac which has an open wild policy but dose schedule like uh, this is five drop and that is 2 ml of dose schedule is there one is monovalent and second is pentavalent and 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 but both one is to be kept at minus 15 to minus 25 degree temperature it's a liquid frozen vaccine the other one is a liquid vaccine so these are some of the differences still exist but but then we have allowed the interchangeability even at the session site that would mean a place where they were receiving a rotavac will also receive rotavacil and vice versa over the period of uh, this introduction what we have seen we have seen that the number of uh, hospitalized cases were analyzed and the rotavirus positivity rate under in the children under u5 during the post vaccination period showed a consistent declining uh, declining trend while the vaccination covered showed an increasing trend so so this is what were very clearly said and if you really see the rotavirus positivity are the blue bars which which you can see that slowly it is going up and and the dotted lines are the percentage of coverage of the rotavirus vaccine in this country what also has been seen that uh, the vaccine after introduction two years after introduction we looked into the two group and and this is the group we have broken down into less than 6 months 6 to 11 months and 1 to 2 years as one group and second is 2 to 5 years as second group and and this uh, one up to the 1 to 2 years group this is the group where we have looked into these are the children who were eligible and also got the rotavirus vaccine and and when you look at the 2 to 5 years group these are the, ch- uh, the children who had not received the rotavirus because they were not eligible for rotavirus because rotavirus was given within first year of life and this is that is after 2 years you can, one could easily see that not only the children who group which has received rotavirus there was a reduction but also in the group children where they were not eligible for rotavirus there is a reduction in the rotavirus incidence so in conclusion entagi recommended rotavirus introduction and product interchangeability in the universal immunization program the introduction was supported by scientific evidence on efficacy safety and program preparedness post introductory evaluation carried out in 2022 which showed that the rotavirus introduction was successful uh, and and uh, rotavirus introduction in uf uip program has reduced the burden of rotavirus in the country thank you very much thank you so much you did a great job keeping to time i'm just going to share the microphone with you here okay so <clears throat> this is one of the very important principles of adback that we have plenty of time for discussion and uh, and questions uh, but the onus falls on you to ask those questions and so we want to get the ball rolling thank you very much there are already hands shooting up which is very encouraging um, and uh, let's go straight away the gentleman there now uh, before you start there is a routine you have to use your mic you have to turn on the mic so that everyone can hear what you're saying. Oh, you, there you go. And oh yes, and sorry, and tell us your name so that we can keep a score. <laughs> so, uh, 
Can I be heard? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm Sornindu Kaviraj and I represent Genova Biopharmaceuticals from India. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, these days there are technological advancements in the vaccines that are being produced, uh, which do not have much of historical data. Uh, what is being done is uh, limited clinical safety and efficacy. And those vaccines are then tried to be introduced into the immunization program or commercial uh, you know, launch. How does the committee evaluate such vaccines which, which are relatively new, technologically advanced, but doesn't have uh, a, too much of a data in the past? Thank you. Two very short, I would say that uh, when you have seen the subgroup, which is uh, consisting of experts, they would not only look into the various literatures being published, not only look into the global evidences, the global recommendations, the global technical committee, but would also invite the manufacturers to come over and make the detailed presentations. And they would go into the detailed documents which the manufacturer provides. And then finally, based on those detailed documentation, they would be taking the final call. So it's a technical recommendation. So let me not look into two things. One is the Drug Control General of India, which would look into any documents being given to the DCI. That is for the regulatory purpose, and that is where they would give the recommendations on licensing the product or not. The Entagi would look into not only what has been submitted to the Drug Control General, but also the other evidences being submitted or submitted even by the manufacturers to take a call. Yes, you next. My name is Angel Babea. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding pharmacovigilance because there were many concerns regarding the safety of the vaccine before implementation. Have there been any pharmacovigilance uh, vigilance information regarding the safety after implementation in, in the program? Yes. Uh, when we are saying that the manufacturers are submitting the documents to the Antagi, so it's a clinical phase one, clinical phase two, clinical phase three. Phase one is a safety efficacy phase two. So all those data is already being presented if it's a new vaccine which is getting introduced. If this vaccine is already in the program, so you look into the safety data and, and the other uh, safety data which is being published. And not only that, once we have introduced this vaccine, we also have a safe vac. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a software which where we are recording the AFI and putting it into the system. So, so I would say that the before introduction, during introduction, and post introduction, there are processes by which we are measuring the AFIs. Uh, the gentleman there, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so, Dennis Christensen from Boda Pharma. Um, I'm curious, you showed that, that uh, the, the rotavirus vaccine was uh, licensed in 2014 and, and only launched in 2016. Is it normal that you have this window from, from license to launch? And is it something that is changing after Corona? See, when we are looking at the rotavirus, uh, I would say internationally there were only two manufacturers prior to 2014. The second point is that the because the vaccine has been manufactured by the Indian manufacturer and being licensed in India does not mean that the vaccine will get introduced into the national program. So the national program looked into the various evidences in 2014 and 16 and looked at the different products available in the market and that them have shown you the three products which was there. Two was international product and one was the locally manufactured product. So so it took its own decision and time to introduce. Yes, lady with the green again. There we go. Hi, Tanya Shuchak, uh, the Gates Foundation. Um, you mentioned that, you know, when Rota was, was introduced, a decision, which is not an obvious decision, was made to introduce two very different products. And I'm curious as to kind of what drove that decision to have two different products and how has that experience influenced decision making since then for other products thanks so so let me put it up like this the, the introduction of a product uh, of rotavirus is a technical decision but the procurement is not a technical it's more of a procurement processes so any vaccine which is licensed will be procured if they become the l1 and, and therefore in 2017 we 
obviously had two products. One was Lifeolize and another was uh, Liquid Product. The program had a dilemma because the, the both these products, uh, the development uh, platform was different. The Both these products, one was a frozen vaccine, another was a uh, lipholized vaccine where you have to reconstitute it. And, and therefore, the entire processes were totally different. And then one was 2.5 ml and, and that vaccine was only five drops. And, and therefore, uh, uh, it's a program dilemma and, and program uh, is driven by what the procurement happens. And, and then later on, program was not allowing for its interchangeability. Later on, we went to the technical body. Technical body said, technically, there is no issue, but we still kept on ensuring that this vaccine does not get interchangeable. Uh, except that when the entity said that uh, there is no issue of uh, uh, mixing it up, so we allowed it in the child, a particular child, if he goes from one particular area to the another area, the vaccine is allowed to be mixed up. But later on, the manufacturer came out with a liquid project, not a lifelized project, uh, uh, and, and that's where it helped us to ensure that because the process is now you don't have to reconstitute the vaccine. Now you don't have to have a reconstitution series of drawing one something and then putting it there. And, and the dose also become 2 ml part. So keeping that in mind, the, the process becomes simplified for the national program. And because your frontline workers administration this vaccine, and that's where we started allowing them to be interchanged at the session site. Uh, the lady with the stripes at the back. Hi, it's Stephanie Vicare, Banner Institute. So building off Tanya's question, I think it's really interesting in terms of the healthcare worker training that would have been needed to introduce two different vaccines. And I know that's something we've often struggled with, that kind of communication and rollout. So how did that evolve? And do you feel that it was particularly complicated or it was rel relatively well received? See, uh, when we were looking, using at uh, the lifolized vaccine, so they were using the syringes, they were using the needles, we were afraid that uh, this uh, vaccine, they may not inject in the mouth. And, and therefore, uh, uh, we had to ensure that uh, the syringes, the needles were totally different uh, and, and it's a plastic uh, part of it. The syringe does not fit into regular syringe part of so these were various parts that had to be looked into before we have allowed this vaccine to be interchangeable. And 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 then uh, these were our hands-on training where we have actually taken out a regular syringe and a needle and, and we have also had this syringe and we have showed them that you cannot mix it up. And and uh, these are uh, the training where we had about five to six modules where we had theoretical part of it, the hands-on training, and then the AFI and other components being discussed during that training part. So we have lots of equity in this course. We have questions from the right, questions from the left, questions from people with lots of hair and not very much to have. But you can always buck the system by catching my eye in between. So the lady with the tartan shirt. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I am Farzana from uh, India, representing the Hamdard Medical College. Sir, I have a question to you that uh, you have mentioned that before the introduction, the, there were uh, like various evidences of intersusception for the rotavirus vac vaccine. So were there any cases of any such uh, in our country, like after the interaction? So let me put it up. We also had uh, studies okay. on the intersusception and, and what we could document was that there are almost 55 idiopathic uh, intrusion per lakh population. And the introduction of rotavirus just added one intrusion. That, that was the study. But during the program implementation, we have uh, not come across, during, as far as AFI is concerned, for intrusion where we could uh, look into. Uh, the gentleman with the check shirt. Good morning, Matthias Hasso from the World Health Organization. I have a question about the criteria that you had to decide whether to introduce new vaccines. What is the process for identifying these criteria and how is that process amenable to new evidence of vaccine impact? For so, example, I saw that vaccine impact on antimicrobial resistance was not on that list. And that could be particularly important for typhoid or for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, etc. So if, if you have seen that uh, pie that I have shown you, the U5 motility, so we could see that uh, the large, biggest killer of under five mortality was diarrhea and pneumonia. So you have many more vaccines which are there and, and which are not, may not be in the national program, but the vaccine which will have maximum impact will be the vaccine which we looked into it. So rotavirus vaccine was considered because of the high burden of uh, diarrhea under five, for under five mortality. And that's then looked into it that what is the contribution of rotavirus into the diarrhea and where it was shown that almost 40% of the under five mortality 
of diarrhea was because of rotavirus. So I would say that there are many vaccines. Uh, if you're talking about the typhoid again, yes, uh, uh, it, it's not nationwide. It, you have to find out the hotspot. It's the urban area where, where you're talking about the typhoid, whereas rotavirus diarrhea was a nationwide. So, so there are many other considerations which needs to be looked into it. And that, that's where what is your economic burden? What is your economic benefit of introducing a vaccine? So these all needs to be looked into and, and then talk about its introduction. Uh, the gentleman there. In fact. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Emmanuel Mugisha from Perth. Uh, yeah, uh, you showed the um, timelines and all that, but I didn't see the damage of pre-qualification. Is that a factor that plays into your vaccine introduction? And if not, why? Thanks. See, uh, when you are looking at the vaccine manufacturing country, India is one of the lucky country where a lot of vaccines gets manufactured. And 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 I would say that uh, when you are looking at the WHO PQS, is a time taken processes. But in the meantime, the manufacturer is already there. And, and, and I will say WHO PQS also looks into the post-market surveillance data. If you have not introduced a vaccine, where will you get the PMS data, post-market surveillance data? And therefore, I, whenever any vaccine which is manufactured in India and been licensed by the Indian manufacturers, that is uh, the Drug Control General of India, that's where the vaccine would be considered for its introduction. And, and that's where we procure the vaccines on our own self, looking into those specifications. This gentleman here. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Padi, for a very nice presentation. I'm Sandesh Gurung with the EPI team in WHO headquarters. So I had a question more in terms uh, with regards to the structure, right? So you mentioned the subcommittees with the NITAGI, right? So is it the same members of the NITAGI and is it decentralized that help in the decision making of the phased wise rollout for? Uh, the new vaccines in India. Okay, See, when, when you're looking at the NITAG or NTAGI in our country, these are the very senior people and probably they will not have much time to debate upon. And that's why we have the technical subgroup where, where uh, there are two technical ministries also joining it. And below that is the expert group. So so we do create an expert group who has domain knowledge. And, and we leave it to the expert group to take a call. We don't put them any time bar that you have to take a decision within 10 days, 15 days. So they look into the evidences, they even interact with the manufacturers, etc. And, and looking into the detailed processes would make a final recommendations. But that recommendation would then go to the subcommittee. The subcommittee would then look into this detail and if required, they, they may also look for further evidences and, and uh, they can refer back to this uh, this group or they can even ask for more groups. And once this subcommittee is satisfied with the details, whether to recommend or not to recommend or, or to put it into the national program, uh, their recommendations, and then they would go to the NTAGI and then NTAGI would look into it and make a recommendations. And once the NTAGI has made a recommendations, it's a technical recommend. Then it goes to the uh, ministry for its approval. So that's a process that I have shown you. A lady with the floral chair. No. Not yet. Press it again. Uh, there it is. Oh, there was the other box. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm Shana Marie Hamid. I'm from the uh, from the Netherlands, the uh, program manager of uh, the uh, the national immunization program there. And we're just about to implement growth. So thank you for a nice presentation. Um, we are a little bit, I was just wondering how you look at the effect of the ROTA uh, uh, vaccination implementation. I saw the graphs, but in Holland we don't have, if a child comes to the hospital, we don't have, we don't do diagnostics on ROTA, only when the child is severely dehydrated or there's a, a deep problem. So I just wonder how, how you do that in India. That was a sentinel surveillance site. If you have looked carefully, it is in identified centers where we have done that detailed diagnosis. So you will have to take a call that how would you like to have this surveillance on rotavirus? So so once you set up that surveillance part of it in specific hospitals, so you will have to start screening those uh, children of uh, reporting for diarrhea, whether they are having rotavirus or not having rotavirus. And that's how you will get the evidence. Without the surveillance, you will not have your own country data. Yeah, and I'll just add in the UK, what we did was we set up some centers that did quite made it standard of care for quite a period of time before introduction of the vaccine so we could actually see the change when it occurs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah next question. Yes, the lady here. <clears throat> um, Laura Cornelis from Belgium. 
I'm quite interested to see, because Belgium is a tiny country and we still have our immunization program on a sub-national level. <laughs> so I was wondering in India, uh, as it's such an enormous country, I suppose by state you have differences in uptake of, of vaccinations and how it's delivered. How do you take those differences into account when you're deciding at the national level? So when you're looking at the health uh, as such when in India, so we say health is the subject of the provinces. But wherever the government of India would like to give focus, it would be then taking it up at the national level. So national immunization program is a national endeavor. And, and that's where the entire supplies, the entire program, the technical support, etc., is provided free of cost to the provincial governments. And, and the provincial government simply needs to ensure that it gets implemented. So there is no financial burden or any other burden. In addition to this, the provincial government, if they feel that they would like to add, add something more than what is there in the uh, part, they do add. So, the, so it depends upon uh, some provincial governments which, which are having more resources, probably would add some more vaccines into the program. And those vaccines would be coming before the national uh, program. For example, the HPV vaccine, and, and you will, may see some of the literacies already there, uh, that two of the states like uh, Sikkim uh, and, and Punjab has introduced the HPV vaccine on their own, but uh, national rollout has yet not begun. So, so that, that's how the things happen. So I'm impressed how well warmed up you already are. We'll, we'll probably squeeze in one, possibly two more questions. First of all, the lady there with the yellow shirt. And then... Hello, my name is Kat Smits from Belgium. Uh, I would like to uh, get back to the interchangeability of the vaccines. Can you confirm that I understood correctly that this is a theoretical consideration? And if it's implemented, uh, is there a follow-up in terms of um, how effective the vaccine is? See, we, we did uh, the, the non-inferiority studies and, and the interchangeability, and based on those data, the committee clearly recommended that these vaccines are interchangeable, whether it's a monovalent or a pentavalent vaccine, whether it's a frozen vaccine, liquid vaccine, or lipolyzed vaccine. So, so irrespective of their presentation, these vaccines are interchangeable. The bigger issue program had was that the way you administer a frozen vaccine, the way you handle a frozen vaccine, vis-a-vis -vis, way you handle a liquid vaccine, and and the dose that you administer, and and then last lifeless vaccine was not the same. And therefore, if you are leaving it to the program to uh, in a country like India, where it's such a vast country, so you cannot really regulate how the things will happen. So programmatically, the administration has to be very, very similar or, or something similar, at least where people may not find it difficult. So we had a, a reservations of interchangeability in spite of technical decision on interchangeability. But as the pro product become very similar to each other, in spite of still, you will see there are some differences in, in the two one is a 0.5 ml, the another is a 2 ml dose, one uh, is a liquid, uh, another is a live uh, a frozen vaccine where you have to uh, freeze thaw the vaccine and then use it up. So there's a little bit of differences there, but more or less similar, so we allowed the interchangeability. Okay, last question, very quick one, please. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I see that at the technical or scientific level, you already had divergent opinions before uh, it was approved. Um, at the community level, what what level of um, vaccine hesitancy did you experience and how did you go about it? Thank you. See, uh, we, we had uh, various, I would say, studies being carried out. One was the intrusive assessment also. We had data and that's what the uh, people went to the court and, and said that give us the data. They have not done a right kind of uh, interpretation. We would like to do the interpretation. And, and, and finally, the court has to say, no, you can't because it was a multicentric uh, study on, on the intrusive assessment and which clearly uh, shown that uh, the intrusive assessment is not a concern because it showed that uh, 55 intrusions were idiopathic and not because of the rotavirus, and only one got added to uh, per lakh uh, or for 100,000 population. Right. 